Hello, our first topic is controllable and observable subspaces. So we're just going to take a slightly closer look at state space models which are not controllable or not observable and try to identify which parts of the state space of these models can't be controlled or can't be observed and relate these to properties of the controllability and observability matrices that we saw last time. Uh, but we're going to we're going to begin with a sort of a more general linear algebra recap because we're going to need some linear algebra facts as well for things we're going to do in future um, lectures. But hopefully this will all be familiar to you. But we'll go through it anyway. Um, and so what I want to talk about is probably the most important equation in the world. Uh, y is equal to a x. So this is just a linear matrix equation, and we're going to consider the general case where the matrix A is M by N. So we're not going to assume the matrix A is square. And in fact, we're really interested in understanding the cases where it's not square, so where it's really fat or where it's really tall. Um, and I want to encourage you to start thinking about this matrix equation in terms of various subspaces. And these subspaces are going to be related to whether or not this system of equations can be solved. So if we're given a vector y and we're given a matrix A, can we find a solution for x? Is it the, will there only be one solution for x? If there is no solution, can we characterize the sets of vectors y which will have a solution? Or can we characterize the sets of vectors y which, for which there will be no solution? Um, so it's these things that we want to talk about. And um, I want you to encourage you to start thinking about things a little bit more geometrically. And so that's what we're going to talk about first. So here I've just rewritten the equation y is equal to ax and lifted out a few um, details. Um, so, well, we, we've split uh, the vectors y and x into their components, so y1 through ym and x1 through xn. But most importantly, we've split the matrix A into its columns. So there are n columns, because it's n by n, and each column is a vector with m entries. And this is what I've labeled a1, a2, and so on up to an. So this is, a, this is the vector corresponding to the first column of the matrix A. And when you were first taught matrix multiplication, you were probably told uh, y1, so the, the first output is given by the dot product of the first row with the vector x, the second by the dot product of the second row with the vector x, and so on. Uh, but there's a more power, well, I guess not more powerful, but there, there's a sort of a, a geometrical perspective that will reveal, will give us more insights into this equation. And that's to instead write that matrix product. So this is completely equivalent to doing this dot product thing. Uh, but we can rewrite it as the sum of outer products. So this matrix product here can be equivalently written as the first column of our matrix. So that's a1 multiplied by x1, so the first entry in our vector x. And to that, we add the second column of our matrix A and multiply that by our, the second entry in our vector x, and so on. We, so we add up one term for each column in the matrix A. And sort of the picture I want to encourage uh, you, you to have in your mind is that this y, this, this is some vector, and these columns, these are some vectors. And so what this equation is actually telling us is that our output vector is given by the sum of the, fir the first column vector Multi weighted, if you like, by the, the first entry in our vector x plus the second column weighted by the second entry. Um, and this can help us understand for which values of y are we able to solve the equation y is equal to ax. And in fact, we can see straight away from this equation here which values of y we can solve for. For this equation to have a solution, y must be constructible out of a kind of a weighted combination of the columns of the matrix A. So let's just draw a kind of a silly cartoon picture. Let's say um, that M is 2. So the, the output is two-dimensional. So these A's, these are vectors with two entries. And let's say that is A1. So this is the like Y1, Y2. And this vector here is A2. 
So now we see this term here. Well, x1 is just some weighting. So x1 times a1 gives us anything, can give us any point on this line. And similarly, x2 times a2 can give us any point on these, this line. But because both of these lines, I've drawn them so that they're pointing in the same direction. Um, this means that only values of y, so only y vectors that lie on this line here, is only these values of y for which there would be a solution um, to this particular equation if we only had two columns in our matrix A. So we can start to um, build up a sort of a picture for what's going on. Um, so here I'm going to sketch an M dimensional space and by sketch this is not really much of a sketch but it's going to have to do um, and so so the idea is everywhere every point in this blob corresponds to a vector y in this m dimensional space this dot here this is the origin so zero is so the vector of all zeros this lies somewhere in our m dimensional space and we can divide this vector, uh, th this space up into two pieces. And I'm going to call this part the column space. So this is the set of all vectors that given by a linear combination of the columns of our matrix A. So for this example here, this would correspond to the set of points along this line. And this is a subspace of our m dimensional space. And what's the dimension of that subspace? Well, it's given by the dimension of the number of independent columns of our matrix A. So in this example here, we had one independent direction. So this would be a one dimensional space. And so what goes here? Well, we'll get on to it a little bit. Uh, this is <laughs> when I was taught this is uh, uh, these things ha tend to have other names as well. Uh, but I was taught that this was called the left null space. Um, and this just consists of everything else. So this is another subspace. And so if m was 2 and our column space was one dimensional, just as here, then this would be another one dimensional space. And together these two, um, they, they span the whole m dimensional space. So what's the, the point of all of this? Well, the column space this is giving you the set of y values for which this equation will have a solution. So more generally, we have some subspace, the dimension of which is determined by the number of independent columns, which corresponds to the set of possible y's which have solutions to the equation y is equal to ax. OK, so that's sort of like the output space, if you like. Uh, I'll draw on our matrix A. So our matrix A takes an input and turns it into an output. And now let's try and just understand um, the input space similarly. Um, and we can divide the input space up into two subspaces in a kind of an analogous way. Um, and just as we were sort of focusing in on this one before, so the column space giving us the set of possible solutions um, for our equation y is equal to ax. The space I now want to focus on is this one here. It's called the null space. And these are the set of points for which ax is equal to 0. So this is the set of vectors in our input space, such that when we multiply them by the matrix A, we get 0. And this is another subspace. Um, and so what goes in our final piece? This is the row space. And this is sort of quite uh, kind of analogous to the column space. The column space was given by the, uh, the span of the independent vectors um, that for make up the column, columns of our matrix A. The row space is the same thing, it's, it, but we now look at the uh, row vectors instead. So we take all of the rows, we draw them out as vectors, find the number of independent ones, and then identify the space, the subspace that they span. So that's the row space. And 
the complement to the row space is the null space, which is the set of solutions AX is equal to zero. And it's these two that are important for our controllable and observable subspace um, understanding. Um, so this is sort of the, the picture I want you to have in your mind to visualize this equation, y is equal to ax. Um, and in particular, we know that with this equation, we have two um, natural spaces. I didn't label this one on, let's put it on. So here we have an n-dimensional space. So we have this input space, so the set of possible inputs x, and this output space, the set of possible y's. And we're trying to understand which subspaces um, of these input and output spaces correspond to solutions to the equation y is equal to ax, and that corresponds to the column space here. And for which values of our input space do we get nothing out? That's our null space here. Um, and uh, kind of a little teaser, um, we're going to generalize this quite a bit soon. Um, we'll, we'll hint at generalizing this quite a bit here. But Im imagine if we wanted to reverse the role of input and output. Well, the picture that we've just described is inverted, if you like, for the operation of A transpose. So if I understand the equation y is equal to ax, and I now want to understand the equation y is equal to a transpose x, then this is the corresponding picture. The column space and the row space exchange, uh, I mean, the, the columns of a correspond to the rows of a transpose, so that makes sense. Um, and now we get an in, kind of a, an interpretation or another interpretation of the left null space. These correspond to the vectors for which a transpose x is equal to zero. Um, so, so this is our, our picture of matrix multiplication. Um, so what has this got to do with controllable and observable subspaces? Um, well, let's just start by drawing a picture of our state space. So we've got some state space model now, x dot is equal to ax plus bu, y is equal to cx plus du. And let's just say, because it's easier to draw, that it's two-dimensional. So you shouldn't confuse the x's here. I mean, I'm using x1 and x2 now to represent the states of a state space model. Here we were speaking more generally about um, an equation y is equal to ax. So we have some representation of our state space. And we saw last time that the concepts of controllability and observability were related to properties of this state space. So let's just start with observability. Observability was saying, given an initial condition in this state space, and also given an output trajectory y of t resulting from this, can we uniquely determine which initial condition caused the given output? Um, and in particular, we saw that every initial condition could be uniquely determined if the matrix C, C, A, and so on, up to C, A to the n minus 1, where here A was an n by n matrix, if this matrix here had full rank. And what does that mean um, in terms of everything here? Well, yeah, we didn't actually explicitly say what rank is. The rank of a matrix is equal to the dimension of its column space and is also equal to the dimension of its row space. So we talked about the dimensions of these subspaces. It turns out that the dimension of the column space is always equal to the dimension of the row space. And it's this number that we call the rank. So that, that's matrix rank. Now this matrix here, C, C, A, so on up to C, A to the n minus 1, this is a tall matrix in general for um, single input, single output systems, it's square. Uh, but for anything else, it's going to be um, tall. Full rank means that it has rank equal to uh, the smallest dimension. So what are the dimensions here? Well, the important dimension is this one, and that's dimension n. And so this means, in, and this dimension here, this is something 
bigger than n or at least as big as n. Um, and so what does this correspond to in, all, in terms of all of these spaces? Well, it means that our row space is full. So there are no vectors x such that ax is equal to 0. So if our system is controllable, there are no vectors such that ax is equal to 0. We've got an n-dimensional space, so this, the, the row space is maximally large, which means there's nothing left for the null space because the matrix is tall. And um, you might guess, OK, well, what happens if our system is not controllable? So this has some rank less than n. Um, well, then, actually, the set of solutions, this matrix multiplied by x is equal to 0. This corresponds to the unobservable um, subspace. So these solutions with x not equal to 0 um, are the unobservable subspace. So say we only had, so say there's only two columns here and they're not independent. So two columns here, so n is 2 but rank is 1. That means that there's going to be a one-dimensional subspace, which is just a line, that we can't observe. So given any initial condition along this line, so and each point on this line corresponds to a solution to this equation, um, these correspond to initial conditions that we can't um, observe. And more generally, we can't observe the uh, part of, initial, of an initial condition that's pointing in this direction. So if we were given a general initial condition, we would be able to observe this part, but we wouldn't be able to observe the part in the direction of this unobservable subspace. So that's the case for um, observability. Controllability is very similar. So observability was this shaded region. Controllability is going to be to do with this shaded region here. And the controllability matrix, this was this matrix B, A, B, and so on, up to A to the n minus 1, B. And let's turn this into an equation. So this dimension here, this is the dimension of our state space n. And now the condition for controllability was that this matrix had full rank. And so that means that we have a complete set of independent rows. Um, and so what does that mean? Well, it means that the dimension of the column space must be n. And so in terms of the solution of this equation here, that means that for every x, we would be able to solve the equation. This matrix multiplied by v is equal to x. And in fact, if you go and you look very carefully at some of the things that we did when we were deriving the controllability tests. You might have already guessed this, um, but um, it turns out uh, that, well, we're solving for this vector v is somehow related to um, being able to find the optimal input that, or you're finding an input that takes you from one initial point to another uh, final point. Um, and so maybe you can already guess what the uncontrollable subspace is going to correspond to. Well, if this is, doesn't have full rank, so this has got rank 1 and there are two, um, two, two rows, then there are certain parts of our state space x for which we can't solve this equation, and these correspond to the bits that we can't control. Uh, it's a little bit more subtle than that. Um, you need to remember this concept of reachability, in fact, to get the complete picture. But um, but the, so the complete story is any it, yeah, so so if it's controllable, the left null space has got dimension zero, and the column space is everything in the output space. If the system is not controllable, you have some dimension of your left null space, and these cor this corresponds to the set of unreachable. Uh, or the, this is the unreachable subspace. Um, so 
because the definition of controllability is like given any starting point and giving it any final point if you wanted to talk about reachability you're really you would have to put the origin at your starting point um but assuming that our starting point is zero we can reach a final point provided it lies in the column space of this matrix here and we can't reach it if it lies in the left null space um, so there we have controllable and observable, observable subspaces, their relation to these two um, controllability and observability matrices, and also a little kind of a linear algebra a recap with some properties of uh, subspaces and how to think about this equation here in terms of sums of vectors. Uh -huh.